It was a silent night when the stars turned their gaze to marvel at the earth. When the heavens gathered breathless round a lowly stable. When a young mother wept tears of wonder falling on the baby in her arms. And the song of Christmas arose in Bethlehem, soft as the tender beating of his heart. And all was calm, all was bright. Yet could this be the same Son of God, a future King of Kings, this baby, this fragile life? Is this child the one who sits at the right hand, orchestrating Earth's creation? Whose voice spoke the ocean into crashing rhythms? Who crafted the mountains into caretakers of the horizon? Whose hand ignited the thirst of the desert and the surging rush of thunderclouds? Who breathed life from dust, broke the oppressor's rule, shattered the chains of his people like sand, and led them through the wilderness with a pillar of flame? Is this child the one whose presence billows like fog above a mountain peak? Who breathes life into being with a roaring wind, stood defiant in the raging furnace, wrote judgment against villains, and blazed on the lips of the prophets, scorching history's pages with the fury of his might? Could this be the same God who chose to come as the vulnerable babe, setting his throne on straw and manger, drawing forth the tears of shepherds, receiving the gifts of wandering travelers, his fame unknown in this world. He is Jesus, the one who thunders through the heavens, yet whispers to our hearts, who reigns victorious, yet bows to serve the broken. He is God in the storm, God in the silence. He holds this mystery balanced in his hands, holds out questions till they lose their need, until all we see is him. Well, good morning. A little too early maybe to think about Christmas, but my goodness, isn't that just an incredible idea that the God who made the stars and holds our atoms together would come to draw near. We're in a series we're starting this week called Christmas Kaleidoscope. We're going to be pulling out an ancient biography of Jesus written by a friend of his named Matthew who interviewed witnesses to tell us exactly what happened back in the day. And during these opening two pages, he is going to give us a series of names of Jesus. And each of those names, like a kaleidoscope, is going to show us a little different aspect of what Christmas is, what it really means, and what it means to us. If you've ever used a kaleidoscope before, you'll recognize that every turn shows you something different, right? You look through a kaleidoscope, and then you decide, hey, let's take a turn. And as you begin to turn it, suddenly things look a little bit different. And each week, we'll look at a particular name that Matthew reveals to us that Jesus has, the name Christ, the name Jesus, the name Emmanuel, the name shepherd and ruler. And each week, we'll take a turn and we'll twist that back the other direction, and each of those names will tell us a little bit more about what Christmas can mean to us, how we can find hope and peace and forgiveness. So we begin the journey today looking at the name of Christ as we come to that manger and we ask, who is that here? And what was the purpose? And what are we to find? What child is this who led to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? 
just greet with anthems a shepherd's watch I keep This, this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard in This is Christ the King. What does that even mean? Jesus Christ, an expression of affection. Jesus Christ, a swear word when you stub your toe. Jesus Christ, is that his last name? You're waiting for a table? Christ, party of four, Christ, party of four, your table's ready. Is it his title? Is it his last name? What exactly is this idea of Jesus Christ? As we look through the kaleidoscope today, we're going to try and figure out exactly that. It is an expression of affection, sadly often used in locker rooms and stubbing of toes in our culture today, but Christ is not his last name. It's a title. It's a very specific title designed to show us something about who God is, something about what we need, something about why he fulfills hundreds if not thousands of ancient predictions so we can know that Jesus is not just some religious leader. He's not just maybe someone who claimed to be from God, but someone that God laid out in advance very specific criteria so you and I could know how to find God in our lives. See, the Christmas kaleidoscope reveals an anointed king, and that's what the word Christ means, an anointed king. And he comes with a whole new kind of kingdom. And I want to share with you today three reasons why Jesus as the Christ is the predicted king of the Old Testament. And my hope is it will be intellectually satisfying. You can say, I didn't have to check my brain at the door to be a Christian. There is evidence that he is who he says he is but also will connect with your heart that the king you've always longed for, the king you've always hoped for, the king you didn't even know could exist wants to come and reign in your heart and mine. This ancient biography written by Matthew begins by telling us that Jesus is the predicted king. He's a predicted king. It begins in these words. It says, born Jesus who is called Christ. It's his opening lines. And then later on, he says, well, until the Christ. Jump down to verse 18. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. And right off the bat, he presumes that you and I know what the word Christ means and why this would matter to us. So the word means anointed, and the word means king. He's going to build a case that he is the predicted king. Now, if you zoomed out and saw this on a page, you'd see maybe at the top of the biography on verse 1, it says, Jesus the Christ. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And the next part of verse 18, it kind of starts where most of us start the Christmas story. 
kind of skip that first part. We start right off here in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. Most people skip the first 17 verses because it's so incredibly boring. See, you got Christ in verse 1 and a whole bunch of he begot, he begot, he begot, he begot, he begot, she begot, she begot, she begot, blah, 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 blah. But the writer seems to imply that whatever that blah, blah, blah was saying brought him back to his conclusion. Therefore, this is the birth of Jesus Christ. So how does all that boring stuff that we skip over tell us that he is the anointed king? Well, to understand that, you need to know that we have archaeological documents hundreds of years before the the birth of Jesus, giving out very specific criteria specifically related to Jesus' family tree. I mean, lots of people claim to be from God. Lots of people claim to be a representative of God. How do we know Jesus is the one sent from God? That's a legitimate question. And that's what this boring list is designed to show us, how Jesus is the predicted king. Imagine the world's filled with millions and billions and billions of people through time. And so what the writer did is he took all these Old Testament predictions and says, let me help you know exactly how you'll find the one who is the anointed king. He says, let's just say there's 100,000 different nations in the world. His first prediction is that the Messiah, the anointed king, will come from one of those nations, the nation who's related to Abraham. So immediately we just cut down who in the world's population would be the anointed king by one in 100,000. But then Abraham has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. And the Bible predicted that the anointed king has to come through Isaac, eliminating 50% of the alternatives. He has two sons, Esau and Jacob. But the predictions say he had to come from Jacob. Eliminating another 50% of the options. He has 12 sons. But of the 12 sons, the Bible predicts that the anointed king has to come through one twelfth. He has to be related to Judah. Now cutting all the choices down by one twelfth. And on and on it goes, generation by generation, criteria by criteria, eventually leading to King David. That whoever the anointed king is must actually be related to the actual King David who came about 1,000 B.C. So the reason this genealogy is so critical is it's saying I backtracked the genealogy. I checked out Jesus' family tree to make sure he was related to all the predictions we've been reading about since we were kids. That's why that list is so important. People could engage their brain and say, I don't know if Jesus is the right one. Let's check out his family tree. Now, do you know people who are really into genealogies and family trees? And they go to the library. They travel around the world to to study family trees for people. And then they come to family reunions or staff meetings, and they tell you all about what they've done. And the stories go on and on and on about genealogies. And you're thinking, how can somebody be this excited about genealogies? And you can feel a little tear of, of boredom, you know, going down your cheek as they're telling you the story. Well, we had a person like that. A good friend of mine was on our staff for many years. And I asked her to investigate the Hoven name. And oh my goodness, she found there's a lot of Norwegian in the Hovens. So it's Hovend. And on my mom's side, Iltravog. And on my dad's side, Ispines. So a lot of Norwegian coming from our family tree. One of my favorite stories that my dad used to tell me as a kid, and when my dad and I went to Sturgis together, which is a motorcycle rally about 15 years ago, we traveled through La Crosse, Wisconsin, because I wanted to see the place he told me this story. And it's the power of a name and the power of who you're connected to in your family tree can change everything. Now, my dad was in college at the time of the story, and my dad was a bit of a hippie. In fact, he was always wearing these moccasins and went up to here with this kind of fringe coming off the top. And my dad loved fishing. So he always had a fishing knife strapped to the inside of his leg. He was sent up by my grandparents to La Crosse, Wisconsin to go visit his uncle he hadn't seen in about five years. 
So he and a buddy on their motorcycles drove their motorcycles into town, but they can't remember where uncle lives. So they stop at this park that I got to visit a few years ago. And this park is really unique. It's kind of a walk around park, but right in the middle of the park is an island with a cage filled with live monkeys. I thought, this can't be true. And sure enough, I got a chance to see it. So he's there just kind of enjoying the monkeys, talking to the monkeys, talking with a buddy of his. But there's lots of mothers there with their kids. And these two hippie hoodlums just showed up. These motorcycle guys. One's got a knife strapped on the inside of his leg. So they call the cops on my dad. Now, the, the Monkey Island, as I, I heard the story growing up, was now surrounded with police officers bombarding my college-age father with questions. Who are you? What are you here to do? My name's Ross. My name's Ross Hoven. Blah, 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 blah. Who are you here to see? Well, I'm here to see my uncle. Where's your uncle live? I can't remember. Yeah, sure, can't remember. And oh my, this is looking really bad for my dad. So finally, they said, well, what's your uncle's name? Surrounded by police officers all looking at this hippie motorcycle guy. My dad's like, this is not going to go over well. He looks at him, he says, well, my uncle's name is Olaf Espines. Right. As he gets that name out, Olaf Espines, all the looks on the, the police officers go, what did you say? Olaf Espines. Hold on. It's like, oh, no, I'm in trouble now. They go on the radio. Now the chief of police shows up. He pulls his car in, door opens, steps out. And if you look at the little name tag, Captain Espinas. <laughs> Olaf was the captain of the police force in La Crosse, Wisconsin. All of a sudden, he went from being rejected to accepted, dishonored to welcome. You're part of the family. You know somebody. You're connected to the right family tree, right? Instant change by the mention of a name. What Matthew is doing here is showing the anointed king we've been waiting for. I am showing you that this Jesus is connected in every possible way he couldn't control through his family tree to the right family lineage. He's a predicted king. He's the Christ. But not only that, his, his family tree is bizarre. I mean, just bizarre. In, in ways because he is the predicted king of the outsider no one would write down the family tree that Jesus wrote down. Immediately, what Matthew is telling us is that he is the predicted king of the outsider. This is the most shocking family tree if you know who's in it. So let me ask you this. How important is your reputation to you? How important is uh, your image, what you're known for? Pretty darn important, isn't it? How hard do you work to craft that image, protect that image, or hide your family secrets? Most of us like a full-time job hiding our family secrets. In fact, let me just share something. It's been about 10 years. I've never shared this publicly. But I've got this habit that's been going on for about 10 years, and I've told myself to stop, and I, I haven't been able to. I've made commitments to do it, but it just keeps kind of circling back into the pattern. But for the last 10 years, I find myself almost weekly watching The Curse of Oak Island. And it is a, it's a terrible habit. They promise they're going to find the gold. They've never find the gold. It's a total waste of time. And I keep finding myself watching it, presuming you're going to finally find the stupid gold. And my, if people have told me, friends of mine have told me, don't do it. But I got to tell you today, I feel like it's a safe place. For 10 years, I've been watching this stupid show, The Curse of Oak Island. It's one of my family secrets. Jesus' family tree is filled with scandal. And if you were writing a genealogy as a Jewish rabbi, you would scrub out all the scandal. You want to look pristine and beautiful. Look at our reputation as a family. Look at our image as a family. It would only be Hebrews, Jewish people. It would only have men. Anyone who had kind of a shady past or made a mistake or black sheep or said something or became a big, you know, big deal that people didn't want to talk about, they got scrubbed out of the family tree. Matthew does the opposite. Let me just show you a few of those names and why this is telling us that Jesus is the king of the outsider. He mentions a guy named Judah. Well, that's good news, right? You're supposed to be related to Judah. Judah was a self-righteous, judgmental, sleeping around 
patriarch that didn't keep his word. In fact, his daughter-in-law, Tamar mentioned here, ends up dressing up like a prostitute because he wouldn't marry his son off to her, but he was willing to sleep with a prostitute he didn't know was his daughter-in-law and got her pregnant. And that's the beginning of the genealogy. Now that's scandalous, but it continues from there. He mentions people like Tamar and Judah. Rahab wasn't even Jewish. She was from Jericho. She was a prostitute who took Jericho and the spies and, and hid them. But by faith, this prostitute, this foreigner is celebrated in the family tree of Jesus because he is the predicted king of the outsider. And whether you've broken promises to yourself or you've had scandal or you've had shame or you've had that wonderful image that you spent years trying to polish and tarnish and hide, scarred and broken. Jesus' kingdom says, I'm the Christ of all. Everyone is welcome. He mentions Rahab. Ruth, a foreigner who marries into the family. And because of her love and care for a very, very hard to love mother-in-law named Bitter, like literally her mother-in-law changed her name to Bitter. Don't call me Naomi anymore, call me Mara, for the Lord has treated me bitterly, she says. But because Ruth cared for her mother-in-law, she ends up having a child that becomes part of the family line of Jesus. Now, a Jewish genealogy would no longer have a woman in it or a foreigner in it than you and I might have a cartoon or a pet in our genealogy. But this genealogy is just celebrating that God is the God of the outsider. He mentions Ruth. Then look what he says at the end. Oh, David, the king who begot Solomon by her, doesn't mention her name for a reason, who had been the wife of Uriah. Who's he talking about here? Bathsheba. The emphasis here is not that he didn't want to include Bathsheba as much as he wants to remind you what kind of a scoundrel David was. He stole his wife Bathsheba from another man who he then had killed. And that's where his son Solomon came from. Now they eventually asked for forgiveness. They eventually got right with God, but he caused havoc in families, havoc in their generation. And yet God is saying up front, whether you've made yourself on the outside by breaking morals, whether you've been self-righteous like Judah, whether you've been lost in your good works thinking you're better than other people or felt pushed to the outskirts like Judah or Rahab, the Christ is the kingdom for all. Everyone is welcome. He is the God of the outsider. And when you understand that, when you realize that when you were pushed out, when you wondered who your friends are, when everyone else gave up on you, when your secrets came out, and God still said, I'm proud to call you my son or daughter, you made some mistakes, but I'm going to be a friend with you through this, you start getting a heart for the outsider. You want other people to be included who are currently excluded. You want to invite other people in because you know what it's like to not be in. In fact, I was sharing this idea from a, a series a few weeks ago in the book of Hebrews. I talked about how the Bible is just filled with scoundrels and how God works with and loves and interacts with scoundrels. I ran into a friend at the store. She said, hey, we haven't been back since COVID, but we watch every week online. And I got to tell you, that message on why we're all scoundrels just really resonated with us. You know, we all look really good, we smell really good, we drive cars that are really nice, but inside we're scoundrels. And I just remembered, man, it's just so amazing that the God of the Bible works with scoundrels like me. In fact, the story I mentioned there, Rahab and Tamar, I did a whole message on that last year in a series called Novel Ideas called The Scarlet Letter. And why the story of Tamar and Judah is literally the ancient version of the Scarlet Letter. You got a self righteous religion and you got a process, you know, unfaithful woman and how they come together and yet how God works in the midst of it. And Bill said to me after that message, he said, Chad, I just went through a divorce. I feel so much shame. I feel like such a failure. And I heard you do a message about a stinking genealogy. And I just realized I can be part. I've not been scrubbed from the family tree of God. I'm invited. 
don't have to hide my mistakes. I can come with my mistakes. It's the power of grace. It's the power of finding a new kind of king, a king who's the predicted king of the outsider. And then what you do is you find other people who are on the outskirts, and as followers of Jesus, you want to invite them in. Maybe that's financially. Maybe if you don't know, but about two days ago, we've had 100 families who came here to church, and they began to pack meals for those inner parish ministries because we don't want anyone to be excluded from Thanksgiving or Christmas. Maybe you came in today and you saw our giving tree. You said, you know what, we don't want anyone to go without a Christmas. And maybe you and your family are going to grab one of the, 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 the ornaments off there and provide for the partners we have here in our city, inner parish ministries and, and happy church and, and city gospel. And for the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll spread that tree out to the groups we work with internationally and nationally with back-to-back and, and Belize partners. Use our giving tree to say we are spreading the kingdom. We have a kaleidoscope kingdom filled with all kinds of broken pieces of glass. I'm a broken piece. You're a broken piece. Wouldn't you want to be a broken piece too? Join the kaleidoscope and let's be generous to all and say this is a kingdom where everyone is invited. And maybe you and your family were part of the 100 people packing meals together on Friday. Just an amazing way that we can express that. Or maybe for you, being part of that kingdom is inviting other people who, who have never been invited to church, wouldn't think about going to church. They've been shunned by religious finger pointing for years. Maybe Christmas Eve is the excuse you want to use. We're going to do nine services again this year. Several on Christmas Eve Eve and several on Christmas Eve. Tickets are going to go available on December 1st. And it's just a way of inviting people in to the Christmas wonder is our theme this year. To discover a new kind of king and a new kind of peace and a new kind of love. So he's a predicted king. He's a different kind of king. He's the king of the outsider, but he's also the king of kings. Because again, in the list of all these boring names is a whole bunch of actual, famous, well-known celebrity kings. I mean, household name kind of kings. And patriarchs, by the way. Abraham, he's related to Abraham. He's related to Judah, the patriarch of the family. And Boaz, that's the guy who saved Bethlehem from famine. We wouldn't even have a Bethlehem for Jesus to go to had he not saved it in 1,000 B.C. King David, a king named Solomon, his son, a son named Rehoboam, who did some good things but also some pretty tyrannical things. At one point he said, my father scourged you with whips, I'll scourge you with scorpions. Okay, not, not real inspiring. King Uzziah, King Jehoshaphat, King Josiah. And yet none of these kings lived up to the king we longed for. A king that would use their power to serve others rather than using others to serve their power. Every king was about themselves, their kingdom, their might, their money, themselves. And yet they all pointed to a future king we longed for. Couldn't there be a king that was all powerful, but he, he used his power to serve others, to love others, to draw others in? Couldn't there be a king like that? And we saw little pieces of it in David. But then we see he turns into a murderer and adulterer. We see little pieces of it with Jehoshaphat, who calls people back to God with a Jehoshaphat of prayer. But it wasn't the king we longed for. And God says, you may be on the outskirts or you may be very well known. You're known as a king. You're known as a celebrity. People know you by name. People try and make their way to have conversations with you. But you need a king. Kings need a king. Celebrities need a king. People who think they have everything need a Christ, an anointed king. Someone to lead them. Someone to guide them. Someone to direct them. Everyone has a king. The question is, what's the king in your life? Because the king of your life is that thing that directs your life. And Jesus is the one anointed king that when he's king of your life, you get more free, more peaceful, more joyful. Any other king causes anxiety and fear and frustration. Here's an example of some kings. If you take a good thing in your life and you say, Life only has meaning if, and fill in the blank. I'll give you a few statements. Life only has meaning if I have influence over others. Then you have a power king. 
And you can't imagine retiring one day when you don't have power anymore. You don't know who you are when you lost that job. Because it wasn't just that you liked power, it was that it was your identity, it was your king. You don't know who you are without that king. Life only has meaning if I'm liked and respected by others. You have an approval king. And you get so anxious when people don't like you. And we all like people to like us. But oh my goodness, you wonder if life has any meaning when somebody's mad at you. Third, I have a certain amount of pleasure or ease. You have a comfort king. But man, you're so mad at God and the world when you're not experiencing comfort. I attain mastery over my life in some area you could control your kids or control your health or control your circumstances, and when you can't control your health and control your kids and control your circumstances, which none of us can, anxious, because that's the real king. That's your real Christ. That's who's taken over the reign in your life. When someone is there to protect me, codependency, you need other people to protect you. God's not enough. You're not enough. Someone else has to be there to rescue you. You have a dependence king. People need me or rely on me, a helping king. You have to be highly productive. And if you're not feeling productive, and there were seasons in your career you were very productive, felt really good about yourself, now you're not being very productive and you don't know who you are. You have a productive king. If you're like me, you're reading that list, you're like, oh, I think I'm one and I think I'm four, or maybe one, three, and four. Life only has meaning if I am completely free from obligations. You have an independence king. I'm being recognized for my accomplishments and achievement king. I have a certain amount of wealth or possessions, my materialism king. I'm adhering to a certain religious moral code and other people aren't, so I shame them. You have a religion king. It hasn't made you humble or more loving. It's made you more self-righteous and proud. I have a particular look or body image. You have an appearance king. And there were times in your life you looked your best and you're discovering like I'm discovering I'm getting uglier every day. You know, the hair is growing in places it shouldn't and it's not growing in places it should. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to look good. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to have people's approval. But when that's your king, it just causes anxiety and a lack of peace in your life. I have a particular look or body image. I am a member of a certain group, the inner circle king. My children or parents are happy with me. I have the family king, but sometimes your kids aren't happy with you and they don't do the right thing. And you do not want to put your identity into the hands of how your kids obey. Hmm? Does that sound very smart? But when they're the king, they're the king. When Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright is in love with me, I have a relationship king. Some people think the Bible is about a kind of arbitrary list of do's and don'ts that God came up with or Moses made up. But Kierkegaard says it well. He says, sin is building your identity on anything besides God. You see, when God is your king, all these other good things, power, money, influence, approval, family, all good things, but they subordinate themselves to your true identity, a fixed identity, and how God feels about you. And God wants you to build your identity and what it means for him to be your king. And you find out you're worth something because the king says you're worth something. And everything else, you say, you know what, people are mad at me this week. I don't like it when people are mad at me. But thank goodness I don't define myself by people being mad at me. I define myself by what my king says about me. Isn't that beautiful? So don't think of sin as some arbitrary list, although there's certainly plenty of lists. It's really the idea of building your life on your creator. I shared this list about six months ago or something like it in our Hebrew series. And a woman came to me after the service. She said, Chad, I've got the control king and the approval king. I am lying about things I would never lie about. But I'm lying regularly in order to make people happy, in order to keep control. I have a terrible time setting boundaries because it's going to make people unhappy. I'm unhappy. I'm currently unhappy not setting the boundaries, but I can't do it because I got this king. And we talked about anointing a new king in our life. She said, I call myself a Christian, so I say Christ is my king, but functionally, I got a bunch of these that are operating in my life. So here's my question for you as we head into Christmas. As you head into family dynamics that you're going to have, all the kings are going to show up, by the way, at Thanksgiving dinner. And your king is smart. Everyone's king 
king is an idiot. Right? So you judge other people's kings. And the reason you have conflict in your marriage or you have conflict in your family is because you all have served different kings. And your king is convenience, but somebody else's king is approval. And you just can't imagine why your spouse comes to the conclusions that they come to. Different king. So here's my question. Which king are you following? And wouldn't you want to join the kaleidoscope of this new kind of kingdom? This is the king of the unexpected. He's all powerful, and yet he came humbly into a manger. He could, he, he could come and say, I demand you serve me, but instead he came to serve us. This is a king that defies expectations. And when you put him at the center of your life, you find more peace, more joy, more forgiveness. So let's ask ourselves, which king are you following? There's a little interesting thing he, he builds into that kind of seemingly boring genealogy. He, he mentions the word captivity several times because the people of Israel have been in captivity in Babylon for many years. He says, until you get Christ as your king, you're going to constantly be in captivity to fear or, or, or lack of boundaries or lack of happiness. You're in bondage to another king until you find the anointed king, Christ as king. And if you're not sure who your king is, let me give you a quick test. I'll give you a list. Let me give you a quick test. Here's just a few questions to ask yourself to find out who the real king is that leads your life. What are your daydreams? The things you just can't help but think about. Your mind drifts toward this. It's probably your king. Where do uncontrollable emotions show up? You get incredibly anxious or incredibly overwhelmed or incredibly hysterical. Probably because we're messing with your king. Where do you spend your time and money effortlessly? That's your king. I bet you could tell me what your spouse's king is. What are your nightmares? What scares you to death? I can't imagine my life without this career. I can't imagine my life without this thing. I can't imagine my life without this amount of income, this amount of, uh, of money in my savings account. What is that thing that's your nightmare? We're probably starting to talk about your king. And you might call yourself religious, but you're ticked off at God if you're honest. You're embittered at God because God was supposed to really get you that thing. And if you look at your unanswered prayers... And while you're angry at God, it's because you say God's your king, but you really want him to provide the real treasure of what you really wanted. And that's why you're so bitter at God. What God would say to you is it's time to switch kings. Or stop pretending you have one king with your mouth and you got another one in your heart. It's time for Christ, Jesus Christ, to be your anointed king. Which is why he invites you and I to be part of the kaleidoscope. Join me, he says, in spreading the kaleidoscope. That's why in the book of Luke, we see this incredible declaration to the angels. It says to the angels, it's to the shepherds, come to the shepherds and say, hey, shepherds, join the kaleidoscope. Let's come tell everyone what's happening here. And what do they say? Do you remember what he says? Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy will be to all people. Good, bad, religious, irreligious. For born to you this day, in the city of David, oh, David, we're tracing back to his lineage, is Christ the King, the Lord, the name of God. God the King has come to earth, humbly in a manger, as a sign that all are welcome in his kaleidoscope. You know, if a king would be anointed in the Old Testament, they would actually take oil and pour over their head. You literally anointed with oil, a king. That's why the word Christ means anointed. We grew up with some kaleidoscopes, but we had the oil ones. You put oil and stuff in a little lantern, and then you would look at it through the kaleidoscope, and the oil as it moved down would create all kinds of neat images. The oil kaleidoscope. The anointed king. And here's my, my challenge for you this year. This week, today, what have you anointed king and everything in your life is seen through the lens of who you anointed king? Approval, control, or power. And I want to invite you today to anoint a new king, the king of kings, to be the king of your heart. 
And then you can sing like the angels did. There's a new king in town, and he comes with a new kaleidoscope, a new value system, a new priority, a new way to live. And it's a way to live that produces good will toward men. Maybe you want to anoint a new king today. Maybe that list you went, oh, my goodness, I couldn't say it. I couldn't articulate it. Chad, you nailed it. Let me lead you in prayer. And then we're going to sing or hear the words of the songs of the angels. Maybe just start off this way. Say, God, I need a new king. And maybe you want to say out loud, or in your own heart, not out loud, but in your own heart, just say, God, I am surrendering and dethroning my current king. And tell him which one on that list resonated with your heart. Then maybe say, God, forgive me for offering your throne to someone else or to something else. Thank you for dying for me, for forgiving me. Teach me how to spread your kingdom and put you on the throne. In Jesus' name, amen. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous streams. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Have a great week, and we hope to see you all next Sunday.